Please welcome JFN President Andres Spokoini. Thank you, and uh, that is indeed a tough act to follow. Um, I, as probably you figure, will want to start my uh, yearly address to you uh, with a quote from the Talmud. You know, the rabbis in the Talmud were, uh, had a lot of time on their hands. So they were asking questions all the time. And one of the questions they first asked when they analyzed the history of the creation of the world was, why was man, why was the human being created last of all creation? And they say something very paradoxical, as generally most of their answers are. They say, so that he feels humble because even the most insignificant of insects was created before him. But on the other hand, so that he feels all powerful because the world is like this wonderful table set out for him to sit down and just enjoy. Rabbi uh, Sim Chabuni, a Hasidic master, brings in the similar theme when he talks about every person needing to have two pockets and in each of them have a paper. In one it says, for me the world was created. In the other, I am but dust and ashes. And I think that these midrashim are about the basic paradox in Jewish philanthropy and in philanthropy in general. Because philanthropy is about feeling the power to change the world. That's, we are all, that's why we're all here. Because we realize that philanthropy is a tool to have an impact, to be bold, to be there, to change reality. But philanthropy can only succeed when it is done from a place of true humility. And true humility is not easy. It's not easy because, as I said, philanthropy is about being bold. It's about plowing ahead. There are going to be naysayers. There are going to be people that are, sir, you're dreaming, and you have to keep going. You have to have that power to keep going. But true humility is also not easy because, let's face it, we are surrounded by praise. People throw galas in our honor. Grantees say we're great. I always tell people, the moment you open your foundation, you're going to look great. You're going to lose weight, and your jokes are going to be very funny. So it actually requires, that wasn't a cue for you to laugh, by the way. It, so it actually requires a lot of groundedness to be humble. Because humility in philanthropy is not just about not getting ourselves intoxicated by the praise we receive. It's about understanding the intrinsic limitations that we have as independent funders is something about, it's about something much more profound. That's why I think that the key to a successful and meaningful philanthropy is the concept of empowered humility. It is the capacity to be bold. It is the capacity to be powerful, but while being keenly aware of the limitations that, you, that we have as independent funders. It's not about being powerful despite your limitations, is about being powerful by embracing and leveraging your limitation. And here's the paradox, that by embracing your limitations, you can become much more powerful. And this is how it works. These are seven ways in which empowered philanthropy works in practice. First, when you approach philanthropy with empowered humility, you learn the importance of focusing our effort. Yes, we do have the power to change reality, but we can't do all. You can't change the entire, you can't carry the, all the entire world on your shoulders. You have to focus. I always meet with funders and I tell them, I don't want to know what you fund. I want to know what problems are you trying to solve. Philanthropy is like an acupuncturist uh, needle. It's very thin, you have to know where to place it in order to create uh, impact. The better you define your focus, the more effective you are going to be. It's like, have you ever done that thing with a, with a magnifying glass, with the sun, with the rays of the sun that you can light a fire? The heat of the sun is there, but only when you concentrate it with the help of a magnifying glass, you can, you can light a fire. If we 
keep being distracted by the many worthy causes that are there, we're not going to be impactful. Three key words, fewer, bigger, longer. It's, we don't have to do everything, but what we do, we have to do it boldly and with staying power. Second, empowered humility means understanding that change can only happen when we collaborate. And the fact that we're all here today means that the message of collaborative philanthropy is finally taking hold in our community. I remember when I first started at JFN five years ago, um, collaboration was sort of the new frontier in Jewish philanthropy. We were had a push hard on the concept. Now, we, I, I think we cross a line, we are there, uh, but we still need to reach the tipping point. We still need to understand that the problems we face in Israel, in the diaspora, in the world in general, are too complex, too intractable, too difficult to be solved by a single funder. We need to collaborate. Jeff knows that very well, and that's why we're helping funders with a series of handbooks on collaboration in philanthropy, because there's no roadmap. Every situation is unique. And nowhere is collaboration more important than in Israel, because in Israel, we really have the possibility, the opportunity of changing the society, and we have the opportunity of counting with new philanthropic capital in Israel, and that is not just funds, it's also the expertise of Israeli philanthropies that are close to the ground. Philanthropy needs to be a collaboration in, in, at a global scale. Jews are the first global tribe, and yet sometimes we can be surprisingly parochial. We've been, in the, in the last couple of uh, years, we tried to expand our network internationally. We conducted sessions in London, in Singapore, in Hong Kong. Um, in a few months, we're going to do another one in Shanghai. We need to leverage the role we have as a global community because we can reach much farther than we are today. Collaboration means seeing everybody as a potential funder the federations, national organizations, the business sector, the government, is about thinking big about the things we can do together. Third, empowered uh, humility needs to lead us to a very ethical way of approaching philanthropy. We hear about impactful philanthropy, we hear about strategic philanthropy, about emergent philanthropy. I want to introduce today the concept of menschlich philanthropy. How to do philanthropy while being a true mensch. How to be aware of the ethical limitations of our power as a funder. Yes, with the power of the purse, we can force grantees to do what we want them to do. But is that menschlich? You know, moreover, does that contribute to a healthy and trustworthy partnership with our grantee? Menschlich philanthropy means respecting the expertise of each and every one of our partners. Menschlich philanthropy means to be aware of the impact that our grants have in the big system of the community, not just in the program we're funding. Sometimes we do programs and there's a lot of collateral damage from them. Being a mensch is being aware of those impacts. Being menschlich plays in the small things too. How many of us make our grantees go through hoops and obstacles to uh, apply for a grant, filling endless forms and subjecting them to a, frankly, a humiliating process. That's not being a mensch, and it's not effective. It's not effective for us or for them. Integrity in giving is holding yourself accountable to high standards and to know that you're part of a covenant of Jewish solidarity and mutual responsibility. Being a mensch, follows the Kabbalistic idea of Tzimtzum, the idea that God created the world by contracting onto himself. The moral of that story is beautiful as it's relevant today. There can only be creativity when you leave space for others. As funders, we need to practice Tzimtzum. We need to understand that for the others to thrive, we need to leave them space. Menschlich philanthropy is the opposite of whimsical philanthropy. It's not arbitrary, it's trustworthy, it's predictable. And you know what? If we as funders behave like mensches, 
the entire community will follow. And remember, the best vitamin for a mensch is B1. <laughs> Took time, but fine. Fourth, empowered humanity, empowered humility, sorry, demands that we learn constantly. You know, something that it's hard to say but has to be said is that the natural state of philanthropy is underperformance. And why is that? Because philanthropy doesn't have the built-in feedback mechanisms that business have. In business, you're not good, you go bust. In philanthropy, you make a bad grant, you get a gala on your honor, right? You get an award. So in philanthropy, excellence is self-imposed. But we owe it to ourselves to impose excellence in what we do. And we owe it to the community as a whole. Philanthropy is too important and is too an important part of our legacy to do it with mediocrity. But nobody is going to force us to be excellent. No the grantees. The IRS is going to check that we you know, meet the spend down uh, uh, criteria, but it's not going to force us to be excellent. It has to be self-imposed. You know, we all grow up with this model that is called learn, earn, serve. The first part of your life you learn, then you make money, then you give back. That model is all wrong. First of all, we serve all our lives, from children that volunteer uh, with their you know, scouts movements to servicing boards and what have you. But most importantly, we learn all our lives, especially when we're constantly facing new threats. I know literally thousands of funders from all walks of life. What distinguish the true excellent ones is that they are relentless questioners. They never stop asking questions. They, they are never, never complacent. And to really learn, we need to have cognitive diversity. We cannot learn if we are surrounded by people that think only like that. We have folks here from the Singer Foundation and uh, they have done the, the Startup Nation Central in Israel. And one of the key elements of the enormous creativity in the high-tech sector in Israel is the diversity of its population. Because people look at the same problem with a different cultural baggage and they come up with impressively creating ideas. Now, if we surround ourselves with a, in a system that is cognitively poor, our lives and our work as philanthropists will be much worse. And don't worry, when you're open-minded, your brain doesn't fall off. <laughs> Fifth, empower philanthropy means looking for the adjacent possible. You know, I receive a lot of people in my office, and I wrote about that uh, a few weeks ago, and everybody wants to come up with the next big idea. And I finished those meetings and I said, gee, we should declare a moratorium on big ideas for a while. There's too many of them. Let's focus our energy of finding adjacencies, adjacent possibilities in the successful ideas that we have already created. What is, the question is not what is the next birthright. The question is not what is the next PJ Library or what is the next Moishe House. The question is, how can we build on their success? You know, the biggest problem we have in the Jewish community is not, a, is not one of ideas, it's one of scales. And transformational philanthropy is not necessarily about coming up all the time with new ideas. We need them too, Don't, you know, I'm not being uh, dogmatic on it, but we need to look with new eyes at the possibilities that we have thanks to the work that you've been doing for the last few years. Sixth, operating with empowered humility means not just funding programs, but building capacity. And we had a whole session now about why capacity is so important. Now, we tend to regard capacity in pejorative terms as overhead. And we get this obsession that we have to cut overhead. We think we're really smart funders if we do that. And yet, that obsession with overhead only applies to nonprofits. Nobody goes to Starbucks and said, you know what, uh, discount 20 cents of my coffee because I don't want to pay for your rent. You know, you don't buy an airplane ticket and say, you know, I don't want to pay for a pilot training. 
you know, you know that that's the infrastructure that a business needs to function. A nonprofit needs that infrastructure to work. The better capacity they have, the better they can do the work that we need them to do in our behalf. Now, here too, there's some great developments in the Jewish community. A group of funders, they met this morning here, created uh, something called Leading Edge, which tries to create capacity in terms of leadership development for the Jewish community. Our grants are gonna be as only as good as the leaders implementing them. So that's a great sign. Another great sign, and we're gonna to have tomorrow a briefing about a collective that the Avichai Foundation is spearheading, merging different organizations that represent day schools into a massive uh, innovative idea that is going to streamline the, the infrastructure of the capacity of Jewish day school. So I encourage you all to go and listen about it because it's a great example of how can you build capacity and impact reality. So we need to do more. We need to support capacity not only in the, in the programs we like, but in the community as a whole. We need to think that, for example, federations are necessary to support a healthy community and a healthy network of services. And if they didn't exist, we would need to create them. And it would be much more expensive to create them anew than to support them. I urge each and every one of you to look at philanthropy from the independent side, independent philanthropy and communal philanthropy as two sides of the same coin that needs to work hand in hand. Seventh and last one, empowered philanthropy implies recognizing the limitations of philanthropy. And that, paradoxically, is a great thing. Why? Because when you realize that, say, poverty or anti-Semitism or youth at risk are issues that are too big for philanthropy to tackle alone, you're gonna reach out across sectors. You're gonna start looking, wait, wait a minute, maybe I can partner up with the business sector. Maybe I can work with the government. You know, we just had a great session about PRIs and impact investing, and I'm very happy that we've pioneered in the Jewish community this whole idea of impact investing, which is nothing else than thinking of how philanthropy and business can interact. In Israel, many of our partners, and you know, Rashi and JDC and uh, Shachav, they are great examples of how we can partner up with the government to leverage their funding. The beauty of recognizing the limitation of philanthropy is that you work across sectors. And all of a sudden, your playing field is not just your pot of money to give grants, it's the enormous resources of the government and of the uh, private sector. So, my dear friends, seeing philanthropy with the two pockets of Rabbi Sim Chabunim is about being bold, but being menschlich. is what allows us to realize our full potential as philanthropists, because this crazy world in which we live that is sometimes very scary, it's also full of opportunity. But in order to realize this opportunity, in order to fulfill the promise of this new world, we need to look at it in a different way. You know, we live in a permanent state of crisis. We move from one existential threat to the next. We are like the person who goes to his annual checkup every year, and he's so concerned about his blood pressure, his cholesterol level, like the really dangerous markers, that he forgets that he hasn't been to an uh, optometrist for 20 years, and he's become nearsighted. As a community, sometimes we're nearsighted. We miss opportunities that are out there for us to see and to seize. Because this world that Jake and Lisa were uh, describing is full of promise and full of opportunity. So let me finish with a story. A, sm uh, a small apple tree is planted in a field of pine trees. Every night, this modest little apple tree looks up to the sky and sees that among the leaves of the pine trees, there are the stars. Now he thinks that the stars are actually the fruit of the pine tree. And he says, you know, that's unfair. I have only apples 
and they have stars as fruit. Uh, this is not right. So he cries bitterly to God, and he says, you know, how come I don't, they have stars, and I have just apples. It's unfair. I want stars. I want stars. For all response, God gives a whole sense, a big wind that knocks a few apples uh, to the ground. And a little child walks by, walks by the field and sees and takes one of the apples and cuts it horizontally. And what does he see inside? A star. So the idea is that when we dare to look differently at the world, when we dare to look differently at ourselves, we can find things that we knew we had, that we, that we had all the time, but we didn't know we had. We need to be like that boy that cut the apple like this, rather like this. Only when you look at it in a different way, you can find all the hidden stars that we as funders have and we can give to the world. Looking for the star means looking for what makes you unique, for that thing that only you can give the world. And this is what philanthropy is all about. It's about finding why the world is going to be different because of you. It's about boldness and humility. It's about breaking the status quo while respecting tradition. It's about leadership and inspiration. It's about listening and learning all the time so that you can find the star inside you and in each and every one of the people you help. We need the naivete of that little child who thought that everything was possible, even finding star inside of apples. Because after all, philanthropy is about achieving impossible things. We are a stubborn and stiff-necked people. We are annoying, we are argumentative, we fight, we're terrible. But but one thing is sure about us. As a people, we never, ever give up. This is a room full of people who saw the invisible and did the impossible. And you know what? We never get discouraged because we, the Jews, are the people for whom only the impossible is worth doing. Thank you. And um, before... Before I, I leave the stage and I eat the apple, uh, I wanted to thank the people that make JFN possible. Um, you know, I'm blessed with working with an indefatigable team. You all know David Ezer. David is somewhere around here. I have to tell you, I have to tell you, dealing with the, rec you know, the, the complexities of this conference, in a huge team of one is, is, an amazing, is an amazing feat. And David, I can't be grateful enough for your great, for your great work. Uh, we have here our Israeli team, lead by, led by Maya Natan, and the presence of so many Israelis this time is due to their great work. Sivia <laughs> schwartz getzug is our West Coast director, and we have had an enormous growth in the West Coast and that's thanks to CVS' great work and our champions and leaders in the West Coast. Samantha Anderson, our senior director of membership and her team have done an amazing feat of work by doubling our membership in three years. And having this big conference here is a testament to their great work. So thank you all very, very much. Now, if you, call, if you call the JFN office, you're going to probably be greeted by the voice of God. That's Scott Casper out there, who besides having a great voice, is just the person who has to deal with all my mishigas in the office and keeps the office running despite uh, precisely that mishigas. And last, but certainly not least, Judy Mann, our COO, who who owes me every day and you surprises me with her 
dedication, her commitment, and her support. I want to thank the Listak Foundation for their incredible support in this conference. I want to take some of their uh, strawberries home. Um, and the uh, Jewish Community Foundation of San Diego and the Federation of San Diego for offering such a warm welcome. Without the sponsors of the conference, and there's many of them, um, this conference wouldn't have been possible. So thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Finally, JFN has the most outstanding board any Jewish organization can dream of. We are we have in our board the best minds, the best and the brightest in the world of Jewish philanthropy. I'm blessed to work every day with them. Uh, and because it will take a long time to thank each and every one of them, I want to thank them all in the persons of our two co-chairs, Avi Naor and uh, Angelica Berry, that <laughs> are are not just great funders in their own right, they are just great human beings, an example of menschlich philanthropy and of empowered humility. So thank you, Avi, thank you, Angelica, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.